right. How many of you brought your Bible with you this morning? Will you hold up the Word of God all over the building? And I want to ask you, if you will, to join me if you, in the Old Testament this morning, page number 367, if you have an old Schofield Bible, or to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 12, 367 in the Old Schofield Bible, or 2 Samuel chapter number 12. And in just a moment, I'm going to read one verse, just one, and then I'll ask you, if you will, to leave your Bibles open and just follow me along here for just a moment, okay? And we're going to look at something together from this text. Thank you again for being here. I would like to encourage you to be back this afternoon at 5.05 for prayer room, 5.30 for the service tonight, and we're looking forward to having a good time together in our service here this afternoon. And you're invited. If you're visiting, we invite you you to come back. Of course, if you're a member, we're just looking for you to come back and to have a good time together in God's house tonight. All right? If you're there now, 2 Samuel chapter 12, would you say amen? amen? All right. All right. Look this way. Question. What in the world are we doing here this morning? What are we doing here in this place this morning? We say, preacher, it's Sunday morning. It's church. And I have the responsibility of being here. Well, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that. Glad you feel that way. But really, really, what is our purpose for being here this morning? Why are we here? And uh, you say, well, preacher, I'm here because somebody would call me if I wouldn't here. Well, I'm glad we got folks who check on each other. But really, the main reason that we're here this morning can be summed up in just one word. And that word would have to be the word worship. That's what we're here to do this morning. We are here, gathered in this place this morning, to worship God. You know, the word worship is one of those good Bible words. It is used in some form or another more than 190 times in our Bible. And really to define what worship is, it's really difficult. It's be like me trying to define what light is. I looked up the word light this week in the Webster's Dictionary, and here's what it says. Definition for the word light, that which makes it possible for us to see. Oh, my. There's really not a good definition for the word light, and really, there's really not a good definition for the word worship. I could give you some synonyms, words that have similar meanings, don't sound alike, but have similar meanings, and maybe here's some synonyms for the word worship. Maybe the word adoration, we adore God, or maybe the word adulation, we lift our voices in articulation and praise God, or maybe the word appreciation, we show God how much we appreciate and are thankful toward Him, or maybe the word admiration, we admire God for who God really is. The word worship actually comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word, which means this, worth-ship. So I guess maybe a definition for the word worship would be you and I giving praise to God for His worth. Or maybe I could say it like this, He is worthy because of His worth. Worship is when you and I come and we set our focus and our attention upon God and we give God the glory for who He is and for what he's done. Can I ask you a question? How long has it been since you worshiped? Now, I'm not asking you how long has it been since you come to church because most of you, most of you were here this past Wednesday night. But how many times do you and I actually walk in the doors of the house of God and how many times do we actually worship? I mean, not just coming to church, not just bringing your Bible, not just hearing singing and not just listening to preaching, but how many times do we come to church and really, really worship God? I kind of think it like this right here. I have in my pocket this morning, I have in my pocket a little dime. I used this illustration not long ago, but there is a dime in my pocket this morning. And let me tell you something about the dime. It's the smallest of all of our coins. It's only about, it's less than three quarters of an inch wide that way. It's, it's the thinnest coin that we have in our American currency. And if you've ever, you've never done this, but if you've ever counted it, around the rim of this dime, there are 118 indentions or divots. You ever done that before? You ever had... I mean, just got to think, I, mean, I need to do something. I'm going to count how many marks there are. We've never done that before. But you know, when you hold this dime out here and you compare this dime to the size of this building, boy, that dime's awful small, isn't it? I mean, when you stop and compare the size of this dime to the size of this building, I can't remember exactly, but something like 52,000 square feet of, of space in this building and when you compare this dime to this building, boy, that dime looks so small. 
But you know something? If you bring this dime very close up here, then the dime becomes so large that it overcomes the size of the building. And I think many times you and I come to church and we drag all of our problems and all of our baggage and we come into church and, and it's right, right up here and we can't see the vastness and the bigness of the God that we serve because we've got our problems. We've got our problems too close to us. And it hinders us from seeing how mighty and how great that our God is. I don't know who all I'm speaking to this morning, but maybe as you walked in the doors this morning, you, you drug in all your problems, and, 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 and you're going you're gonna to hold those problems up so close that you're going to miss the God that is so big that he would love to step in and help you bear the problems that you've got and bear with the struggles that you've got. And, and therefore, because we hold our problems so close to us, uh, we leave the building and we're frustrated and we struggle along and we, and we feel discouraged and we want, to, we want to throw up our hands and quit. And really all we need to do is just worship. All we need to do is get our focus upon how big God is, how mighty that God is, how great that God is, and how, how much God wants to help us with the struggles and the problems and the burdens of our life. And the key to it all is just maybe if we could stick the dime back in the pocket see the enormity, the enormity of the building that we're in, or put our problems in our pocket and look at how big the God that we serve and love is. You know, worship really is what we've been put on this earth to do. God put you and me on this earth not to drink liquor or run around and see how much trouble we can create and chaos we can cause. God put us on this earth for one purpose, and that one purpose is so that we might worship Him. You and I were created for God, by God, and to worship God. That's why we're here. In fact, let me show you some verses along these lines. Psalms 95 verse 1 says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Can we stop for just a minute, just a moment? You know when we sang a minute ago, how, how much heart did you put into singing? I mean, so many times we just stand, we stare off into space, and man, we, you know, we, our minds are so many other places, and, and uh, we're so distracted that we come to church, and we really don't even sing unto the Lord. We don't make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. The next verse says this right here. It says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. I mean, man, come to church and be excited about being here. Then the further verses say something to this effect. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. He made it. And his hands formed the dry land. It goes on to say, oh, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our man. Come. Let us worship. Come. Let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. You know, we're told in the Bible that God seeks people who will worship Him. That John 4, 23 verse says right at the end, For the Father seeketh such to work. Can I tell you something? That is the only thing that we're ever told in the Bible that God seeks from us. I mean, God doesn't seek your wealth, but, but thank you for giving. God doesn't seek your work, but thank you for working. God doesn't seek your, worship, your witness, but thank you for witnessing. But the only thing in our Bible that we're told that God seeks is our worship. Now, let me stop and say this. If we worship God, we'll give to God. If we worship God, we'll work for God. If we worship God, we'll witness for God. But the only thing in the entire Bible that God said, I want from you is your worship. In fact, can I tell you this? The last command in our Bible, God said this right here. This is the last command. Revelation 22, verse 9. Look at those last two words. Worship God. And yet, how many times do you and I come to church and we leave? We drag everything in. We drag it right back out the door with us. We go up the road and we're frustrated and we're discouraged and we're, and we're miserable and we want to just throw, up the throw in the towel and just quit. You know what the answer for it all? Why don't we just worship? Worship. Hey, I challenge you. You didn't know what you were coming for this morning. 
But I challenge you when you come back tonight, why don't you come to worship? You know something I'm afraid in our day? The word worship is just a word we casually toss around anymore. You know, we're constantly hearing things like this, you know, worship and praise music. I think all music ought to be worship and praise. I think that good song they sang, it, I'll meet you in the morning. That's a good worship and praise song, ain't it? And I, I, that, that song, I'm the reason, I'm the one that he died for. That's a good worship and praise song. What congregationals did we sing this morning? Glory to his name. That's a good worship. And, hey, we got worship and praise music right here in Woodland, but it's just the right kind. Amen. And then we hear this, worship and praise services. Well, shouldn't all services be worship and praise? I mean, shouldn't we gather here in this place in an attitude of worship and, and, and praise? Well, I'm, I'm preaching this morning on the subject of worship, the way of worship. And of all places to learn about worship, I had you to open your Bible to one of the darkest pages in the entire Word of God. If you have any knowledge about the Bible, and most of you do, then you'll know we're right in the middle, 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're right in the middle of what we could call David's darkest deed. We know the story. We know what happened. I've told you before, the life of David can be divided into two sections. There is that before Bathsheba part of David's life, and then there's that after Bathsheba part of David's life. Now, before David met up with Bathsheba, he could do no wrong. But after he met up with Bathsheba, he could do no right. His life went with just one big ball of trouble and chaos after his uh, affair, his, 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 uh, his, uh, his, uh, his relationship with Bathsheba. Let me tell you this. Long before there was a water gate, there was a Bathsheba gate. Long before there was a Richard Nixon, there was a King David. And baby, let me tell you something. We're familiar with the fact that he lusted, that he committed adultery, and then the great cover-up that tried to go on to cover all that up, that, that actually climaxed in the murder of one of the greatest soldiers that he had in his army. And right here in the midst of all that, we find some great truths about worship. In the middle of all of that. Let me set the stage for you. David and Bathsheba have committed adultery. Uriah is now dead. Probably a little time after that, David takes Bathsheba and they get married. There's a little child that has been born out of that adulterous relationship. And when the little baby is born, we're told that the little baby is born very sick. Very, very sick. In fact, deathly sick. Well, when David gets word from the doctor or whoever, the baby's very sick, something is wrong with the little baby. David goes into the house of God and for seven days he prostrates himself in the house of God. I mean, he's laying there, I mean, at the altar of the Lord and he's pouring his heart out before the Lord. Really what he's trying to do is he's trying to pray to change the mind of God. Aren't you glad that sometimes we can pray and change the mind of God? You see, Dave, God has already told David, hey, David, because of your sin, because of what happened, this little baby that's been born unto you is going to die. God has already given David the word, the baby is going to die. And yet the Bible said that God, uh, that when David hears about all this, he goes into the house of God and he falls out before the Lord because he's thinking maybe through my prayer and through my pleading, I can change change the mind of God. There are instances in our Bible where God changed his mind about things. In fact, if you'll look in the same chapter, look at verse 22, the Bible said they questioned David about his actions before and after the death of the baby. And in verse 22, David said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? David is saying, hey, you never know what God may do. God is a merciful God. God is a long-suffering God. God is a kind God. God is a good God. You never know what God might do. And he's pleading and he's begging with God to change his mind about the little baby. And we know from the story that God did not. But there are instances in our Bible where people prayed and changed the mind of God. I think about old Hezekiah back in those days at the age of 39 years old when God sent Isaiah the prophet in to see that old king and say, hey, set your house in order. You're going to die. You're not going to live. And, and, and he's 39 years old. He's leading the nation in the great revival meeting. It's perilous times. Here's Hezekiah trying to serve God, doing that which is right in the sight of God. And God sends him a message. You are going to die. You're not going to live. Go ahead and set your house in order. And what does Hezekiah do? He turns his face toward the wall. 
He begins to pray and cry out to God. And it isn't long until God sends that prophet back in there and said, okay, I'm going to give you 15 more years, a 15-year extension to your life. The praying of Hezekiah changed the mind of God. Now, let me remind you in our text, David prayed to change the mind of God. However, God did not change his mind. But when all that was over, according to verse number 20, when all that ordeal, when all that very sad situation was over, in verse 20, the Bible said that David came and he worshiped God. Now, from this text this morning, I want you to bear with me for just a moment. This is Sunday morning, and I appreciate you being here. I don't want anybody to walk out these doors that think that thinks the preacher hates me. I don't hate you. I'm going to say some things here in just a moment that maybe, 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 maybe make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But I, I, it's not my purpose this morning to make you feel uncomfortable. But I just want to tell you what the Bible said about worship for just a minute. And I want you to bear with me for just a second. First of all, look at verse number 20. I want to talk a little bit about the preparation that is required for worship. The preparation that is required for worship. Now, the one thing, according to verse number 20, that we learn about David's worship is that he made some preparations before he went to worship. Can I have an amen? In other words, I think what David is saying, switch and walk into the world, uh, to the church on Sunday morning and go into worship mode. It doesn't work that way. There's got to be some preparation that is made before you and I ever come to worship. There, there's got to be some careful and some very purposeful preparations made before we can worship. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at verse number 20. And let me show you, number one, he had to get prepared, number one, in the area of cleansing. He had to get prepared, number one, in the area of... Look at verse number 20. The Bible said, Then David arose from the earth, and then notice this next phrase, And he washed and anointed himself, and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Now, here's David, seven days he's been laying there at the altar. Seven days he hasn't bathed. I think the indication is seven 24-hour days he's been laying on the altar in the dust of the floor, begging God to change his mind, begging God to step into that situation, begging God to heal that little baby. And for seven days he's not bathed. And yet the Bible said that before he, uh, after the baby dies, he receives the word, the baby is gone. Uh, the Bible said he goes home, he, wa he washes himself, he anoints himself, and then he comes into the house of the Lord and worship. Now, I get it. I'm not stupid. I get it. This is talking about a physical and outward cleansing. David thought, before I can go to church, I'm going to go clean up. I'm going to go bathe myself. I'm going to go wash myself before I go into the house of the Lord. I get it. This is talking about an outward cleansing. But can I just this morning, and I don't think I'm doing the Scripture any harm, but can I just for a moment say a little bit about it? an inward cleansing that must take place before we can come to worship. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, ladies and gentlemen, just as David would not go to church and worship God unless he was clean on the outside, you and I can't come to church and worship God unless we're clean on the inside. You know, the truth of the matter is I'm afraid too many times, too many times we want to go out here in this world and we want to speak the world's language and we want to act like the world and do, do the sinful things and then we want to come to church on Sunday morning and as I said a moment ago, we just want to flip a switch and go into worship mode. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you something. Your heart is not a duplex where sin and the devil can live on one side and Jesus can live on the other side and six days of the week you can go out here and live for sin and the devil, and then on the seventh day, walk into the house of God, throw a switch, and start living and worshiping Jesus. It don't work like that, friend. There must be, there must be some cleansing that takes place before we can worship. And the only way for that inward cleansing to take place is for there to be some confessing that takes place. There ain't a one of us in this building this morning that hadn't sinned this week. There's not a one in this building this morning that hadn't done something that we've offended a holy and a righteous God. And there's not a one of us in this building this morning that shouldn't have spent some time before we came to church this morning getting our heart cleaned out, getting our soul cleaned out. There's nothing in the world like the clean feeling that you get when you've confessed your sins and they've been forgiven and they're under the blood of Jesus. I tell you, that's a good feeling, friend, when everything is right between you and God. Then and then only can we worship. We can't, we can't cuss with the world six days 
and come to church and automatically just worship God. Look at these verses right here. Watch this for just a moment. James 3.10, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Stop! You mean to tell me that there's people that out of the same mouth that they want to bless God with, they'll, they'll curse, curse man with? I like what James said about this. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Then he goes on to say this. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? You got one messed up fountain if one minute you're drinking bitter water and the next minute you're drinking sweet water. It don't work like that. And you and I can't sing the world's music and come in on Sunday morning, flip a switch, and sing the Lord's song and worship Him. We can't speak the world's language and come in on Sunday morning and automatically, just because we're in church, start talking church language and worship God. It just don't work like that. I'm here to tell you, there's going to have to be some cleansing before there can be some worship. Here was, there was, uh, first of all, there was preparation in the, in the, uh, in the area of cleansing. But now look at me. There was preparation in the area of clothing. Look in our text. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. Now read these next four words. And changed his apparel. Can I tell you something? Before David went to worship, David, hey, David was the king. He was the, king. He was the, he was the best king on the earth in those days. In fact, let me tell you this, he had to be the mightiest king on the earth. I mean, at this time, under his reign, Israel was the world's superpower. Let me say it like this. Israel was the United States of his day, or what we used to be. It was the world's superpower. I mean, everybody looked to Israel, and everybody looked to King David. He was the king among kings on the earth back in those days. But this king was going to meet with a bigger king. Or kind of say it like this, this little K king was going to meet with this big K king. And he would not go in a flippant manner. He would not go in a casual manner. David said, if I'm going to go in that church and I'm going to meet with God, I'm going to be dressed appropriately for worship. I see it just like you see it. I drive by church signs all the time that says something to the effect, come as you are. I see that everywhere. I see it about every church you go to. There are some exceptions, but most churches have those signs out front. Come as you are. Or they'll say something like this, choose your blend or choose your whatever, whatever. I, don't, I just got stuff on the sign. But can I tell you something? I understand all that. But I see it as nothing more than another subtle attempt of the devil to drag God down to the standard of men. Hey, I tell you, most of us just don't understand how holy and how righteous God is. If your plan this morning was to come to church and give God a little dap, you in the wrong place. If you plan to come to church this morning and give God a a chest bump. Hey, you're in the wrong place. If your attitude about God is God is just another member of my posse, or if your attitude about God is this, he's just a big guy in the sky, you don't understand how holy, how righteous, how just our God is. No, sir. I know what some of you are probably thinking right now. Preacher, it don't matter how you come to church, how you dress when you come to church. Preacher, it don't matter how you dress when you come to meet with God, look at me. Tell that to the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Tell that to the priest working around the Old Testament tabernacle. And I know what you're thinking, preacher, you're in the Old Testament. But aren't you and I in the New Testament called priest? So let me get this straight. God had a standard of dress for the priest of the Old Testament. But when we come across the 400 years of silence in the New Testament, all that's off. It don't even matter how you dress anymore. Just come on. I happen to think it does matter. Now, I get it. Not, I'm not talking about tuxedos and evening dresses. But I do think we ought to put on the cleanest and the best we got because we ain't coming to meet with some little K-King. We're coming to meet with a big K-King. 
We're coming into the presence of God, folks. This is the house of God. This is where we come, hopefully, to meet with Him and to worship Him. And listen to me. If, that's, if what you got on is the best you got, you wear it, you'll be accepted here in this place. But those of us that have been saved any amount of time, we know how we ought to dress when we come to the house of God. Hey, we're not coming to meet with the president. I don't blame you if you went to meet with Biden if you dressed like you just walked in off the beach. I wouldn't blame you about that, but hear me, hear me well. We ain't coming to meet with the president. We're coming to meet with Almighty God. And it's about time we started lifting ourselves up to the standard of God instead of dragging God down to our standards. I had somebody asked me not too long ago, Preacher, why do you always wear a suit when you preach? And here was my answer, and it was as kind as it could be. Well, I said, when I watch Brian Slocum on WXI Channel 12 and get the weather news, he has a suit on. And then when I flip over a few channels and I watch the ESPN channel and I want to get the ball scores, that guy has got a suit on giving me the latest news from the world of sports. And I said this right here. If those fellas think it's important for them to be dressed up to give me weather news and sports news, how much more is it right for me when I'm trying to give out the best news that the world could ever hear to be dressed appropriately when I step into the pulpit to preach the Word of God? Hey, brother, I'm not going to look like I walked in off the beach with flip-flops on, a pair of Bermuda shorts, and my shirt unbuttoned down to here. Hey, I'm not preaching that kind of a God. I'm preaching a holy God and a righteous God and a just God. I think we ought to raise ourselves up to that standard. And if we're going to worship, man, we're going to, have to, we're going to have to do some preparation. There's some preparation required for worship. Now, don't you go away. Don't you leave out of here saying, Brother Tim said, we got we to gotta go to Belks and buy our clothes before we can come to church over at Wooden. Are you kidding me? Can I tell you something? Look at me. You dead wrong if you think I said that. But I did say you ought to put your best on when you come to the house of God. I mean, we're coming to meet with God. And I know, it's, I know some of you said amen and others of you looking like, like a calf looking at a new gate. I get all that. But this is still Woodland Baptist Church, ain't it? We're still old time, right? We still preach out of the King James, right? We still try to sing the right kind of music, don't we? Then are we going to do all that and let everybody just come to church just dressed any old way? Are you kidding me? There's going to have to be some preparations required for us to worship. Notice, second of all, not only the preparations required for worship, but don't you see the priority reflected in worship? Look in our text here what happened and follow the progression of the story here. In the progression of the story, what we find is this. The baby is born, but it's born sick. When David hears of hey, King, King, you need something to eat. And verse 17 said he wouldn't do it. He refused. He refused. He would not do it. He refused to eat bread with him. And then in verse 18 and verse number 19, we read this, that in process of time, the little baby dies. David then sees his servants whispering back and forward in verse number 19. And David says, uh, hey, is the baby dead? And they say, king, in verse number 19, yeah, the little baby died. Then David arises and he goes to the house of God and he worships. Now watch this. Notice the priority of his worship. He has been seven days without anything to eat. Now, if I got that counted right, that is a total of 168 hours. Or if you want to get a little bit more technical, that's 10,080 minutes. He's not had a morsel of anything to eat in his mouth. You would think it would say he rose up, he went home and fixed him a bowl of cereal. Or he rose up, he went home and made him a sandwich. He rose up, he went home, and he, he uh, sat down to a kingly feast. doesn't say that. He rose up, he took a bath. He changed his clothes, and he came to the house of God, and he worshiped. In the midst of all that was going on in his life, he made a priority out of worship. You see, worship, worship put the dime where it was supposed to be and put God where God was supposed to be. Man, he saw the vastness and the greatness of his God. I mean, he had so much going on in his life. I mean, you stop think about it. His world had just fallen to pieces. He had a funeral to plan, arrangements to be made, before he had a little baby to bury. But before he did any of that, he worshiped. Even though he'd failed. Even though he'd messed up. 
Even though he was facing the consequences of the choices that he made, he still went to worship. Can I tell you something? Worship must be a priority in our lives. Can I tell you something really about worship? Worship makes us either effective or ineffective for God. Let me prove it to you. You know, and how many, don't raise your hand, but how many of you are sitting here today and you're miserable? Don't raise your hand. And please don't point to anybody. We're trying to have revival. And you're miserable. And you're frustrated. And you're discouraged. And you've just been thinking about, I'm done with this. I'm through. I, I'm, I'm finished with this. You let me tell you what will cure all that? Worship. I'm going to prove it to you and I'm going to wrap it up and we're done. In uh, Luke chapter 10, remember the story? Jesus has gone over to the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They live in Bethany. And Martha evidently has invited the Lord over for supper. And so the house is a buzz of activity. I mean, there's people sitting, the disciples are there, Lazarus is there, Mary and Martha is there. But Martha, being the person that she was, she was off in the kitchen. And boy, she's preparing the meal. She's boiling macaroni and she's mashing the potatoes and she's cooking the, uh, the, the rolls or the biscuits. I mean, she's trying to get things ready while all the while her sister Mary is sitting in the living room, sitting at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him. Well, it lulled till Martha is totally frustrated by all that's going on, how she feels like she's being done and she's being overlooked. So she comes to the door, opens the door and says, Jesus, bid her come into here and help me. And Jesus Jesus says, Martha, Martha. Say that with me. Ready? Martha, Martha. He said, uh, he said you are cumbered and troubled about with many things. But Mary, she's standing there. Look at me. She's got flour all over her. She's been in there doing all that. She's beat with heat. She's stuck in the muck. She, she's hot. Oh, she's frustrated. She's miserable. Hey, tell her to come in here and help me out. Jesus said, wait a minute. Martha, you're distracted by many things, but Mary has chosen that needful thing to sit at my feet and worship. Can I tell you something? When you and I don't worship, we get so frustrated, so miserable, so disappointed, so discouraged that we just want to throw in the towel and just quit. But when we see God for who God is and we worship Him for who He is, it helps us to make it through the tough times of our lives. Yeah, can I tell you something? Work is no substitute for worship. I know, I get it. In the dictionary, work comes before worship. But in the economy of God, worship becomes before work. Because when we worship God, we make ourselves effective when we work for God. You see, there's a priority reflected in worship. When's the last time you worshiped? Not when's the last time you come to church. When's the last time you worshiped? And I want to close with this, but look at this, number three. Let's talk a little bit about the, the persistent resolve of worship. David's world has been rocked. There was a scandal. There was guilt. There were run, rumors running rampant. The kingdom's in turmoil. His heart is broken. His burdens were great. His problems were many. But before he had the first press conference trying to divulge what had actually happened, he went to the house of God and he worshiped. There's just something about worship that'll get our minds off of everything that's going on around us and focus our attention our affection on the one above us. I don't know what you drug into this building this morning. I don't, I don't know the things that you've struggled with this past week. You know, they sang a moment ago, you know, we, we failed to pass the test, but he passed. Maybe you've failed some big tests this week. Maybe some things coming, some temptations come in your life. Man, you let God down big time. I don't know. But can I tell you what we ought to do? We ought to get up here on this altar. We ought to say, God, when I come to church, let me come with a heart of worship. Let me come and just for a few moments, just sit down, set everything aside, set all that down over there. Let me focus my attention and my affection upon you and let me worship. When's the last time I asked myself that question? I got to tell you something. I can't remember. 
I remember the last time I preached. I remember what I said. But worship. I don't know when's the last time I worshiped. When's the last time you worshiped? God is seeking such to worship Him. I kind of got it in my mind. The Lord will hang around where people worship Him. He inhabits the praises of His people. Psalms 22 says, let's worship. Let's worship. Let's bow our heads. Father, help us this morning.